Hello everybody, welcome back to another Farming Simulator 25 Tips and Tricks video. Today we're going to conclude our chatting with NPC series with a series of conversations that we had with Noah down here at the sawmill. Now while I think David is maybe a little bit misunderstood, Noah is very eccentric and well, he's got a completely unique look on lots of things. So you might find some of his conversations just a little bit awkward. Now there were opportunities where Noah repeated himself quite a bit from one year or one day to the next. So I'm not really sure how much Noah has as far as content. But I can tell you that his content is quite diverse and is sometimes a little bit comical. Without further ado, let's hear about Noah. I don't know you. Let's change that. My name is Noah. I am a 45 year old male. My hair is red. I like licorice and walking through the woods. I prefer coniferous trees to deciduous trees. Alright, I didn't know this was a farmer's only ad. Hi Noah, tell me more. You want to know more? Then I will comply with your request. Well, my father Harold is a retired carpenter. He built a successful carpentry business focused on chairs. He did many other things as well. But chairs were his favorite. That's why he called his carpentry company Charismatic Woodwork. Yes, exactly. A pun as a company name. That's him, a jokester through and through. And he always wanted me to step into his shoes. But as you grow up, you start to develop your own interests. And do not necessarily share a knack for unnecessary amounts of wordplay. I'd rather provide the raw wood itself. That's why I'm a lumberjack, doing the lumbering. There are so many factors to keep in mind before you can even start thinking about carving something after the wood harvest. Type of wood, its quality, age, moisture levels. Being a lumberjack, I start the process even earlier than the usual wood carver. I plant the trees. I have to think about the quality of the soil the climate, the forest composition, etc. Tending to trees is akin to conducting an orchestra. Achieving harmony is essential to creating a symphony of beauty in every little masterpiece. I am the conductor. My family is just playing some out-of-tune trumpets, if you know what I mean. That does not sound very nice. I profusely apologize if this is perceived as hostile. They are good people. Skilled, but I think puns and basswood are holding them back. To continue the story, however, lucky me, my sister Melissa took over his workshop. She is quite the skilled carpenter. Always wanted to work at his wood shop, and so our father granted her wish. I never really got into carpentry the way my father and sister did, but I do in fact like carving wooden figurines. Both my sister and I have a talent for wood carving. The moment we were able to handle a wood carving knife, we were competing to carve the most elaborate figurines. It's still up for debate which of us is more proficient at wood carving. She primarily uses basswood. If you ask me, that's enough to end the debate right here. She used to live in Silver Run Forest. Her figurines are quite popular over there. She still holds that over my head. That's more information than I expected. I think a lot of words were said now. As I have to proceed with my business, I wish you farewell. It's nice to see you, I guess. Can I lend you a hand? These are not easy tasks. Are you up for it? Or are you like David? I can help you with removing dead trees. Remove some dead trees, will you? They are unsightly and pose a risk for other trees. We need to eliminate that threat. You in possession of the required tools? Renting is an option, but not free. How do you want to do it? I got everything I need. And now we have a contract for dead wood removal. 
Is there a reason for your visit? Or do you just want to maintain human relations? Can you explain forestry to me? I can spot helplessness from a distance. I spotted you. How to grow trees. How to plant trees. Planting trees is nothing like planting crops. Farming is a craft. Growing trees is an art form. Forget everything you know about fertilizing, weed control, or anything like that. Just focus on the essential things. Get yourself a tree planter, fill up the machine, and drive one row after another. Enjoy the beauty of simplicity and plant some trees yourself. What equipment do I need? This will be a short list. First, you need a tree planter and saplings. Get yourself a pallet fork attachment that suits your preferred loader, as you sometimes need to transport the saplings to the machine. That is all you need. Art doesn't need complexity and a lot of tools. It just needs to grow. And the same goes for planting trees. Can I buy some grown trees? You can, but I don't understand why you would. You're robbing yourself of the experience of planting trees yourself. Of course you can buy trees. There are different sizes to choose from. The bigger the tree, the more you have to pay. You can use them as decorations for your farm and other properties. I would not recommend using them for actual forestry, as they would not be cost effective. You should plant them yourself, like a real lumberjack would do. How to cut down trees. What's the difference between deciduous tree and conifer? Depending on the type of tree you plant, you have different options for harvesting and using wood. If you planted deciduous trees, you require a chainsaw to cut them down. Because of uneven growth, financially, it makes more sense to process this type of tree into wood chips. Conifers, on the other hand, may be cut down with either chainsaws or harvesting machines. Because of their long and even trunks, they are perfect for selling or processing into various products. There are exceptions to the rule, such as stone pines and cypresses. Although these trees are conifers, you have to cut them down with a chainsaw. What equipment do I need? For deciduous trees, you require a chainsaw and a wood chipper. For conifers, you require a harvesting machine. Unless you want to cut down stone pines and cypresses, then you need a chainsaw. Why can't I cut down some of the trees with a harvesting machine? Well, I guess you are trying to cut down a deciduous tree. Those can only be harvested with a chainsaw. In case of doubt, always use a chainsaw. You can never go wrong with one of those fine instruments. Another benefit, you look professional and cool while using them. How do I cut down trees? Use the chainsaw of your choice and position yourself in front of the tree. Turn the saw in the desired angle and direction before starting out. The tree will always fall in the direction you are cutting. After that, you need to cut the branches from the trunk. If you use a harvesting machine, it saves a lot of steps harvesting conifers. In your vehicle, you can select the desired length of harvested trunks. Just position the header of the crane as far down as possible at the trunk of the tree. Press the respective button to cut down the tree, and it's done. The machine will separate all the branches and cut the trunk to the desired length. How do I get rid of stumps? Get yourself a forestry mulcher. You hook those onto the tractor and shred your stump. It is as easy as it sounds. Wood chips? What are wood chips used for and how do I get it? 
wood chips are shredded wood, typically used as a heating fuel. The extraction of wood chips is profitable, especially in the case of deciduous trees. Compared to other trees, their odd-shaped trunks yield less money. Theoretically, it is possible to process other species of trees to produce chips. You also get wood chips as a byproduct of wood processing. For example, if you are working with wood or boards in a carpentry shop, you will receive a small amount of wood chips. Of course, you would not get as many as if you produced wood chips directly. What equipment do I need? You have two options to produce wood chips. You can choose between a standard wood chip machine and a self-propelled wood chipper. The wood chipper machine is cheaper and comes with a small tank suitable for smaller trees. This machine is sufficient. A self-propelled wood chipper is an autonomous vehicle and doesn't require a tractor. Therefore, it is much more expensive. But I recommend if you plan to chop large amounts of wood to focus on running a forestry operation. It's also better for large trees. You also require a trailer to transport the wood chips to the point of sale. How do I process wood into wood chips? The process is the same for standard wood chippers and self-propelled wood chippers. Use the crane to pick up the pieces of wood on the ground and lift them onto the conveyor belt. When the wood is properly placed on the conveyor belt, it is pulled into the machine and turned into chips. If you have cut logs into smaller pieces, you can place them on the conveyor belt by hand, but this takes a little longer. Tree marking sprays and signs? Why should I mark trees? When doing forestry and operating heavy machines within the dense forests, applying a particular mark can provide a visual reference for waypoints and the assigning of certain actions. This can also help you and your workers keep track of what you're supposed to do and where. What do tree marking signs mean? Depending on where you are from, Tree markings here may differ from those you know from elsewhere. There are regional differences when marking trees. So let's go through the signs so everyone is on the same page. To mark a logging trail leading to an actual logging location, trees are marked with two horizontal parallel lines. Trees marked with the backslash are supposed to be removed. Trees marked with a circle are not supposed to be chopped down, but supported instead, meaning leave him and his friends alone or plant new trees in the vicinity. A horizontal line with an arrow facing down indicates that you should saw at exactly this height. Dead wood is indicated with an exclamation mark. You will see this when working with me on dead wood missions. They are to be removed. An X can have various meanings. Often it just marks trees should be removed for whatever reason. Feel free to assign any meaning to this mark when working on your own. Let's not forget the colors. Both symbols and colors usually do not follow a strict universal code, but are merely local or even a forest ranger's personal preference. Winches and yarders? What's the difference between a winch and a yarder? That's a good question. I can tell that you are improving. They are both used for moving your logs from one place to another. Winches are devices designed to pull heavy logs using wire ropes. They help you move long logs of chopped down trees through the forest to a collection point. From there, you can transport them to selling points or production sites. Yarders are used to bypass hilly or otherwise impassable terrain and haul logs out of dense forests. They are using a system of cables to pull them up from their stump to a collection point. 
What equipment do I need? There are two types of winches. Attachments for your regular tractors or so-called multi-purpose tractors, but that's all you need. Yarders are always hooked onto your tractor. How do I use those machines? Using this kind of machinery is quite simple. Winches are just connected to your tractor. Drive to the designated logs, attach a rope, and you are ready to go. Yarders need a few more working steps, but they are no sorcery. Just unfold your yarder and attach the rope to a fitting tree. Now you can send the carriage on its way or make it follow you, so it's always right behind you. After that, just attach a log. Just keep in mind that some yarders need to be placed uphill. Transport? What do I need to know about transporting logs? The answer might seem simple, but transporting logs can be quite complicated. There are a few things you need to know. When you cut a tree, you typically use a yarder or a winch to transport the logs to a collection point. From there, you transport your wood to your shop or warehouse. You can do this by trailer or container depending on your account balance and your forestry focus. Using a log loader is perfectly fine for a small-time logger, but professional lumberjacks like me use containers. What equipment do I need? You only need a tractor and a log loader for the trailer option. The container option requires a variety of machines. You need a truck, a low loader, an excavator, a wheel loader, and, of course, a container. How do I use the machinery? Using a log loader is as simple as it sounds. Just attach the loader to your tractor. After that, use the crane to load the logs onto the trailer. It needs some practice, but you'll get it. Containers are a bit different. They come in different sizes. You should harvest trees accordingly by selecting the cutting length when operating the harvester. But keep in mind, the longer the logs, the more profitable they are when you sell them. The length of the logs should be as close as possible to the length of the container. Too long, they won't fit. Too short, you will gain less money and waste space. An excavator is used to load the containers by lifting the logs and driving them to the open side of the container. After the container is filled, you get the truck and the flatbed and prepare them for your container. To load the containers onto the low loader, you use a powerful wheel loader with a pallet fork. Just as you would load a pallet onto a smaller truck, you pick up the containers with the fork and carefully place them on the truck. I need to go. It's nice to see you, I guess. Clarify your inquiry. What are you currently working on? I am pleased with your choice. The patent office finally replied. They denied my patent application. I'm sorry, are you disappointed? It was simply too intricate for them to comprehend. I endeavored to register some of my woodwork. If you've ever attempted to tie a tie, you know it's an exceedingly complex process. So I carved a wooden tie to avoid the hassle. And I made the whole tie from wood. Not only the blade, tail, knot, everything. That may sound simple, but every wooden tie would be carved with a special technique. You can't open them. They are directly carved around your neck and are designed for single use only. This artificially inflates demand, which is good for the business as it may increase sales. 
But for the consumers, there is a downside. They have to repurchase every time they want to look splendid. However, in my opinion, as an authority in all things fashion, the benefit of a unique wooden tie outweighs this minor inconvenience. Also, as single-use products are criticized for their lacking sustainability, they are required to leave a deposit. They get it back once they return the tie, and the resulting scraps will be used as firewood. They have to come back anyway, to safely remove it. That sounds very impractical. You haven't tried it for yourself. First one is free. The neat thing is, there is a perfect target audience for a product like this. Single men like me, they don't have a significant other to fix the tie. Imagine putting on your tie. It is totally crooked, but you haven't noticed. The moment you would leave your house, you would be a laughingstock. But with a wooden tie, everyone would congratulate you on your excellent taste and your formidable attire. And when you are done, you could use it as firewood during those cold months. Okay, you got me. I need one. Perfect. However, I must inform you there is a waiting list. Wooden ties, and for some reason, cat trees, are in high demand around here. The first one makes sense. The latter is a mystery. Anyway, I must attend to tie production now. Tell me more about yourself. Clarify your inquiry. Tell me more about yourself. Do others have the habit of talking about themselves like that? As you might have already heard, I am a private detective around here. You can call me the lumber detective. At your service. But I can see you require some context. I will comply and provide it to you. Since our official policeman is never to be found anywhere around here, I am focusing on some petty offenses. Yes, I am a lumberjack first and foremost. I work with trees, and wood is my daily business. Working as an investigator is something I like to do as a hobby. Some people call it a passion, but I dislike an emotional term like that. I would personally describe it as a resourceful use of my brain capacity and an afternoon delight for rainy days. It is also useful to the community. Of course, the big cases should be handled by our law enforcement, but not every case is something to bother them with. And that is the moment when people ask me to help. Usually they do not, but they do not have to. I take any case proactively. So I investigate missing goods, strange sightings, and any other mystery that requires solving. Like crop circles, I will elaborate on that case as soon as I deem my files ready to be publicized. But my case closed stamp is currently out of ink. Why do you do that? I started my own agency when I was a tiny human. I was a big fan of detective stories, and I rather enjoyed the portrayal of logical deduction. I can relate to that way of thinking. Take me, for example. Look at my hands. Anyone looking at me and paying attention would guess my profession. The way they look is influenced by my daily work as a lumberjack and my other hobby of wood carving. I sometimes have a bit of sap in my hair. That is also a clue. You can deduce that, even if I'm not wearing my protective work attire for handling chainsaws and other tools. However, if you require that to solve a case, you're not a good detective. And that's how I usually solve my cases. Take a look around the crime scene, be aware of the progression of events, and then draw conclusions. It may sound easy, and sometimes it is, but there are cases even I can't solve. I may consult you sometime. Anyway, I deduct that you have more important things to do now. I have too. I need to get ink. Tell me about yourself. I would appreciate it if you could clarify the subject you would like to discuss. What are you currently working on? I get your need to talk and procrastinate, but I don't share it. Not now. Tell me more about yourself. Please specify. Tell me more about yourself. You know what I like? 
Silence. Let's enjoy it and continue with the talking another time. I need to go. Hello. Can I lend you a hand? I appreciate the neighborly offer for help. Here are the things that need to be done. I can help with transporting trees. I hope you can operate a forwarder. Are you in possession of the required tools? Renting is an option, but not free. How do you want to do it? What machines do I need? A forwarder or a timber trailer. How do you want to do it? I changed my mind. Maybe another time. In the mood to talk again, are you? Tell me more about yourself. Please specify the topic further before we proceed. Tell me more about yourself. Well, if we have to. My old man just sent me a text with one of his puns. I've told you, he is a jokester. I am not. I find it rather unprofessional and it serves no purpose for the craft. If you craft a joke, there should be a finesse to it. But maybe I should tell you more about this person who brought me to life and constantly confronts me with his wordplay. Yes, please. I already told you about his carpentry company called Charismatic Woodwork. If I had taken over his business, I would have renamed it immediately. Back when he was young, he visited Norway with his parents. One day, he met an old carpenter who was searching for an apprentice willing to learn his craft. My father immediately decided to take the apprenticeship and started working for the old man in a town called Bjornholm. As impetuous as he can be sometimes, he informed his parents at the airport he would not return with them. After his apprenticeship, he traveled the world to learn even more about carpentry. On a visit home, he met my dear mother and decided to stay. A few months later, he opened his own carpentry business. He got the building quite cheap, as it used to be an old tuna factory. Like all things, my father took life as it came. I am more like my mother. Things need to be planned and straightforward. The only moments I perceived him as serious was when he was working. Only then, jokes became secondary, and precision took center stage. A good carpenter plans his work down to the smallest detail. That is something that really got me into woodworking when I was still a tiny human. I really wasn't into his quirky side. I'd rather not hear puns all day, so I did my own thing. My sister, on the other hand, has the same bad taste of humor and was perfect for taking over his business. He still builds things and tells customers about how he started his business, including more puns than necessary, of course. He also has some, and I have to give credit where credit is due, impressive woodworking projects on his resume, including a roller coaster. I might elaborate on that another time, when the time is right. That's interesting. Thanks for sharing. You are welcome. Good day. Can you explain forestry to me? What do you need help with? I need to go. You do you. Tell me about yourself. Be more specific. What are you currently working on? I am pleased with your choice. I have put a case closed stamp on another one of my private investigations. Since the ink has just dried, I can now talk about it. Have you heard about crop circles in the area? If so, what have you heard? I only heard it happen. So, one summer evening, a young couple was running around the farmlands, vigorously playing hide-and-seek and whatnot. When the girl noticed strange corridors in the cornfield, they ran right back home and informed their parents. Said custodians immediately suspected tampering with local soil and reported the existence of potential delinquents to the authorities. 
The authorities were apparently handling a case they deemed more important, and I noticed a crowd forming down in the valley. To see what the commotion was all about, the lumber detective immediately took action and visited the scene. Indeed, corridors in the cornfield were confirmed, but the owner of the field was nowhere to be found, possibly abducted. I analyzed the corridors. Have you any idea what they might have been? Oscillated tram lines by the owner? You would think that, but these were circular corridors, not straight corridors. Since these corridors were not straight, but rather erratic circles, tram lines were out of the question. Also, crop circles are usually formed by flattening the crops. However, that was not the case. The corn was harvested, and sure enough, we found the combine harvester left in the middle of the field, without an operator. Since the field was located at the very edge of town, I myself was not sure who the owner of the field was. He was quickly contacted by the others and arrived on the scene. He did not do it, but he told us who had done it. Uh, the Spence is crazy. I know, I know. Please contain your anticipation. The identity of the Corn Circle culprit, the Maze Miscreant, the Roundabout Ne'er-Do-Well. I have not yet decided which nickname best suits this case. It was David. He was contracted to help with the corn harvest but fell asleep in the combine harvester and then decided it was too dark to continue and went home. Case closed. David Zero, Lumber Detective 38. I prevail once more. I figured who else could it be? It was not my most difficult case. I will admit that. I will let you off now. Tell me more about yourself. Shall we focus on me as a person or my work? What are you currently working on? You're almost as loquacious as David. Please don't be like David. Let's stop talking for today. Tell me the reason for your visit, please. Tell me more about yourself. Please specify the topic further before we proceed. Tell me more about yourself. Okay, fine. It may sound very strange to you, but emotions are boiling in me. It takes every fiber of my body to control my elevated levels of adrenaline, norepinephrine, and dopamine. Are you angry? If you feel inclined to express it in that fashion, yes. Yes, I am. Oh, those stones. I wasted a whole weekend, having completed no real forestry work. All I did was move rocks. Rock after rock after rock. I felt like Sisyphus, just with removing rocks instead of rolling one up a hill. The drumming of machines is still echoing in my mind. David and I do not have a lot in common. But our dislike for stones is one of the rare things I can share with a simpleton like him. We talked about those forsaken rocks and stones. He told me how they are causing him great distress as they remain strewn across the fields. One of his harvesting modules even fell victim to their existence. You see, they come in different sizes and for each size there is a different solution. For small stones, you just need a soil roller to push them back into the ground, but this is only a temporary solution. The larger stones need to be picked up with a special machine. If you don't, damage to other machines might be inevitable. So you have to pick them up, thus hindering you from doing anything important. Such a waste of movement and energy. But my problem is not with the field stones. It is my contention with large rocks in the forest. Ah, just the mention of them causes me great anxiety. I can feel the pressure of my blood 
elevating as we speak. Don't you think this is a bit over the top? Excuse me? Do I tell you how to regulate your emotions? Perhaps you could help me with the removal of rocks once in a while. It is not a difficult task. The required machinery would be a hydraulic breaker, a skid steer loader, a wheel loader, and a trailer. Just aim the hydraulic breaker at the rocks and let the machine do the rest. Anyway, I believe I have calmed down at this point. It is true what people say. Sharing your current emotional state can be beneficial when trying to neutralize it. My neurological chemistry should be on an acceptable level again. Thank you for listening to my emotional outburst. It makes me feel ashamed. Darn, now I am mad at myself. I will redirect the anger at the rocks. You better leave. Please specify the topic further before we proceed. What are you currently working on? Okay. My latest wood carving project is finished. Another unique masterpiece. A personal one, too. You might even say I'm proud of it. The fact that I received a letter from the woman of my past led to an excessive release of serotonin and thus irrational behavior. I told you the story, and if we had stayed together, we would now be approaching our 25th anniversary. So I had to restrain myself and think a lot about my reply first. It had to be something unique, blending my emotions with a personal touch. To affirm that the qualities she once admired in me remain the same. She remembers my devotion to wood carving and private investigations. But the success of solving cases like the banana peel pollution in the woods is not relevant to this specific correspondence. So I had to think of something else. Did you carve or something? A wooden letter encapsulating the past two decades of my life, as well as my enduring affection for her. As wood carving always brings out my emotional side, I also carved in a lot of words that I wasn't able to express in the past. I carved a total of 14 pages and just handed them over to the mailman. Oh, the poor mailman. What can I say? Emotions make words bubble out of me, like a mild case of acid indigestion, but less uncomfortable. Enough discussion of emotions. I have to carve a complaint letter to the local supermarket, as they run out of hand balm all the time. They should experience what woodworking can do to your hands if not diligently moisturizing. Good day to you. Hello. Tell me more about yourself. Clarify your inquiry. Tell me more about yourself. Is it common for you to be so inquisitive? I will play along, however. I just received an electronic mail from my sister. She sent me a brochure from the gallery in Silver Run Forest. There will be another exhibition of her carved figurines. I will acknowledge her desire to rub her success in my face, but the jury is still out to decide who is the better woodcarver. Although she was trained by our father, we were both introduced to woodworking at an early age. Immediately, our ongoing woodcarving contest was born. We did not have any special motifs for our carvings, but took any random opportunity to immortalize something in wood. Seen a bird? Carve it. Neighbors got a new dog? Carve it. Hungry for some cake, but no butter in the house? Carve it instead. Our parents had to be our jury, and they had a lot of judging to do. I always suspected them to be diplomatic in their feedback for diplomacy's sake, so their two cents didn't mean all that much to me. While I tried to carve things reflecting reality, my sister adventured into more fictional motifs. I don't know if you heard that ridiculous folktale about that blue rooster. She carved stuff like that. She started carving figurines from Norwegian folktales. Those were intended as a birthday gift for our father, and she did an excellent job on those. 
I chose not to tell her because it would have fed into her ego. She would hold a compliment over my head forever. Same for figurines she made for Silver Run Forest. A lot of people bought and collected them. There is a real collection fever going on. They might need some potent medicine for that. I think I've provided enough information. Let us conclude this conversation about my sister. I will go now and carve something. My next figurine is called David Falling Off a Tractor into a Mud Pit. Again, it is a figurine grounded in reality. Good day to you. Tell me more about yourself. Be more specific with your conversation request. What are you currently working on? I am pleased with your choice. I sense a significant amount of feel-good hormones in my brain. Why, do you ask? I just solved another case in town. Do you mean you're happy? Well, feeling happy is the result of a high level of feel-good hormones, is it not? The circumstances of the case are straightforward. A female individual prepared a strawberry cake and subsequently placed it on her windowsill to cool. So far, so stereotypical, the image of a classic romanticized baking process. But a few hours later, the cake tin was found empty, raided. Sure enough, the local constabulary was called immediately. They only examined the kitchen and found a strawberry jam-infused fingerprint on the windowsill. After a few investigations and questioning, helper Ben was indicted because he was seen in the area. He denied everything. Still, that helper got himself stuck in some contradictions. Classic Ben. But was he actually the charlatan running around, devouring our cakes? As the police did not deem the case very important, it was closed. But Ben's reputation was still put into question. You know how fast word can travel in these parts. He asked me to prove his innocence as I observed the kerfuffle. I didn't feel like standing around and accepted the challenge to look into his case. Tell me, recruit, what would you have done next? I would get testimony from witnesses. Wrong. The police had already done that. We needed new evidence. As I own a standard detective kit, I took the fingerprint left at the scene. It was not Ben's. I stated that with confidence immediately. I have dossiers, including the fingerprints of everyone in town. Now, the only thing left was finding out the identity of the actual culprit. Unlike the lazy constable, I checked the garden. There were prints left on the ground. I didn't even need to measure the size or match the prints with the information in my dossiers. The delinquent had revealed themselves to me. Hanging their head in shame, caught red snouted with jam all over it, like a piece of soggy, jellied up toast found on the floor, marking them with the crime for everyone to see. It was Bill, Katie's water buffalo. Ben was just there, helping to trim the hedges. After he left, our animalistic offender smelt the cake and opened the gate. He then crept up to the window and devoured the cake. I informed the constable to clear Ben's name. They hung up on me in an instant. You're lucky the buffalo surrendered on its own. Excuse me? That's hard detective work. It wasn't that simple. You visit quite often, don't you? Why? Tell me about yourself. Would you prefer to discuss me or my craft? You're almost as loquacious as David. Please don't be like David. Let's stop talking for today. Kindly elaborate on your query. If you don't need any help, we've chatted enough today.
Hello. Tell me more about yourself. Please specify the topic further before we proceed. What are you working on? A wise selection of conversation. Has your grandfather told you about our recent collaboration? Your grandmother's birthday is approaching, and your grandfather has requested that I craft a gift for her, using my skills. His idea was laced with an unreasonable amount of romance, though. I have little affinity for romance, given that many people nowadays confuse it with love. Love is an emotion, whereas romance is merely a form of entertainment, in my opinion. Well, if you say so. Your grandfather requested that I carve a heart with a message. Despite my reservations about romance, I considered it a commendable gesture. The heart is one of the most vital organs in the body. Presenting a replica of such an organ to a significant person must surely be an expression of love. Wait a minute. Is this what romance is to other people? An expression of love? Anyway, let's get back to the topic. While not necessarily my cup of beverage, I did like I was told. It was something new for me, as I had never carved an anatomically correct heart. He wanted an anatomically correct heart? We experienced a miscommunication. However, he remains accountable for his ambiguous, unspecified order. If you want to materialize love, why would you gift a heart anyway? Love is the result of chemicals in your brain. Thus, you should gift a brain instead of a heart. Framed images of computed tomography, for example. Computed what? CT scans of your brain. MRI scans would be even better. Anyway, your grandfather seemed amused. We talked about other possible gifts, and I showed him some of my previous work. He really fancied my floral projects. So we agreed on a bouquet of flowers. There is a beauty in symmetry, and bouquets in particular epitomize this perfection. You have to balance the height and the radius of each flower evenly to create something aesthetic, to emphasize the work that is put into it. The bouquet was much to his liking, and one of my better works as well. By the way, the anatomically correct heart is still in my possession since he declined it. It serves no purpose for me. If it does for you, and you want to give it to someone special, just inform me, so we can transfer ownership of the heart. Otherwise, I will do David a favor, so he can give it to the animal farmer, if he chooses to do so. Shall we focus on me as a person, or my work? Tell me more about yourself. Very well. I need to educate you, so prepare for a lesson and listen carefully. There won't be a test, but that doesn't mean it is not relevant. Am I in school here? Today you are, so please be quiet and attentive. As I'm taking care of and taking from the local forest, let me open your eyes on a few things. Taking from the woods is not like greedily eating at a buffet. You don't just help yourself by taking everything and then leaving. This is what some people think of me and my profession, and it fills me with emotions on the negative side of the spectrum. People only see me felling trees and offering wooden products to them, and think I do that until the forest runs out of wood. That will not happen, and it is my responsibility to make sure of it. A good portion of the forest, which exceeds the borders of our town and where you won't find yourself, is protected. People always forget or ignore there are forestry rules and measures. Rules like selective logging, protected areas, reforestation and afforestation, and other things. In fact, this town in particular had one of those reforestation projects, as your grandpa might have told you. It is important to handle any forest with care and respect, to leave its overall structure intact. Then you can maintain sustainability through biodiversity, regeneration, and vitality. That way you secure the relevant ecological, economic, and social functions of the forests in the region. 
Do you follow me? Not really. You may want to look up sustainable forestry then. I just wanted to make sure you know that my job is not to eliminate all the trees around here. We take what we need, we replace it, and we are respectful of the forest and its inhabitants. It also helps David so he can meditate in one of its clearings. He already got a lesson on littering in the woods, as the fingerprints on a candy wrapper clearly belong to him. I have his prints on file. I am a bit skeptical, but I believe him when he says it fell out of his pocket. But he stays under surveillance nonetheless. For today, class is over. What are you currently working on? Good choice. I'm working on another wood carving project that is nearing completion. Would you like for me to elaborate? You obviously do, since you initiated this social interaction. I will take this as an invitation to elaborate. I am carving an umbrella using good old sturdy oak wood. Strong shaft and handle for a firm grip, and you need it. It is not a lightweight model. To save time and resources, I eliminated some redundancies in standard umbrella designs. It also allowed me to make everything from wood in the process. From handle to canopy, everything is made out of oak wood. Sure, the ribs in the canopy are just for aesthetic reasons, but I think they are less redundant than fragile moving parts. I do not like unnecessary movement. A wooden umbrella. You grab it by the handle and hold it over your head. The whole item is one sturdy piece of wood. It fulfills its purpose and won't easily break. Even if the wind slaps it out of your hands, or if hail season is upon us, you will be thankful for it. Bear in mind that you should hold it with both hands. As I noted, it is not a lightweight model and might even become a hazard when flying astray. I will now proceed to finish it. You, on the other hand, please proceed to walk away. You visit quite often, don't you? Why? I saw you coming. I am prepared. What can I do for you? I would appreciate it if you could clarify the subject you would like to discuss. Okay, fine. Sorry, what were you saying? I was lost in a wooden maze of my thoughts. Usually, I'm not one to embrace melancholy, but sometimes even my brain gets clogged by some what-ifs that require my attention. I need to chop those thoughts down swiftly. Uh, uh, if you really want to know, I guess that'll be fine. I will tell you, but one thing up front. This is a story of man meets woman, but I wouldn't call it a love story. Those are a form of entertainment that is loosely based on courtly love of knights and noble ladies, and is most often out of touch with reality. I better start from the beginning. When I was at the young age of 20, I was already a strong fellow, knew how to chop and carve. So my most important skills were already developed and put to good use, but I had not much of a personal life, lacking friendship. At that time, I was a bit of a shy person, but definitely not an expert on making friends. One day, since stagnation is the bane of my existence, I decided to improve my social skills. Despite my shyness, I started going to the local restaurant more often. On a boring Wednesday evening, a few of the townspeople were eating dinner at the local diner, but I saw no one I could spontaneously win as a companion for the process of food intake. So I made my way to an empty table, ordered a burger, and let my gaze wander around the restaurant to analyze my surroundings. Then the sight of her hit me out of nowhere, 
This woman was just sitting there, talking to her friends. I immediately adored the way she tilted her head to the left side when she was amused. Her laughter made her shine brighter than the sun. I might have squinted and stared at her for a while. Good thing she didn't notice. I had to get to know her, but my mind and my heart were racing at 134 beats per minute, an acceptable rate for a forest hike. As most introverts can probably confirm, there was an invisible force pushing down on me, keeping me in my chair. It was a sturdy chair, but it was an uncomfortable situation, that's for sure. When I regained control over myself, everything seemed to happen like I was on autopilot. I stood up, I walked over and said, My name is Noah, I think your laugh is beautiful, would you like to go out with me? And the rest of the story is for another time, as I am currently revisiting this memory and its consequences. So, if you don't mind, let me stay here for a while all by myself. No conclusion? Bummer. Please specify. Sure! I'm working on another wood carving project that is nearing completion. Would you like for me to elaborate? You obviously do, since you initiated this social interaction. I will take this as an invitation to elaborate. I am carving an umbrella. I do not like... No, why would you, if it's raining and you intend to use it? You grab it by the handle... Tell me the reason for your visit, please. Shall we focus on me as a person or my work? Is it common for you to be so inquisitive? I will play along, however. I never finished the story about her. You know, the woman in the restaurant. I told you how I asked her out. Back in the restaurant, she tilted her head to the side and said, Yeah, definitely, with a smile. I had to process this for a moment, as I had not expected a positive answer to my inquiry. I think she could see me analyzing her unexpected positive answer as I froze for, well, what seemed to be an eternity. People grabbed their burgers and consumed a whole bite in the meantime, or two. Soon after that, we went on a date. It was quite a success, as she appeared to find me charming somehow. I didn't understand why, but I was not going to complain. As the weeks went by, we went on more dates. We grew really fond of each other. You see, love had always been an abstract and mysterious concept for me that I could not really entertain. Feelings are quite enigmatic, but the chemical process is not. I knew I was in love with her. However, I did not know if she reciprocated, though. So, one evening at the diner, she sat across the table and reached for my hand. I put my hand on hers and I could feel her pulse. It was elevated and her pupils were dilated. Those are two simple indicators for said process that was happening. At this moment, I applied for official partnership status and asked her to be my girlfriend. With a smile and a tilted head, she said yes. And so began our newfound relationship. Those three letters started the best six years of my life. Well, we moved in together, adopted a cat, although I am a dog person, and did all the things couples usually do. Despite me being a loner, I enjoyed every second of it and recognized the positive influence she had on me. But that was a long time ago. We were generally happy, still there was something she was missing in our relationship. Over time, she stopped tilting her head while she was smiling. I don't think she noticed for quite a while. At one point, she was spending more and more time in her hometown, visiting family and old friends. Nothing wrong with connecting with your roots, of course. But... That's when we drifted apart. I will continue my story 
another time. You helped me unclog my brain from all that sawdust of the past. For now. I need to go back to work. Hello. Please specify the topic further before we proceed. Let's explore what I can share with you. Okay, I'm done exploring. Ideal timing. My mind needs some unclogging from all the wood shavings I've been producing. Let me continue the story of the, excuse the expression, love of my life. As I already told you, I recognized she was missing something in our relationship, even before she did. Despite me being a well-read hobby detective, I just didn't want to acknowledge it at first. She wanted to build a chicken coop, so we went to the hardware store to get everything necessary. Almost immediately, an employee tried to sell us some overpriced, cheaply manufactured tools, as they often do. I bluntly told him that I'm more knowledgeable than him, and that I knew what I was looking for. I didn't need his expertise from a three-hour corporate instruction video that he got when he started his job. My girlfriend did not chuckle as she usually did when I confronted salesmen with their limited brochure knowledge. That's when I knew something was off. We did not buy anything that day, or any other day. At least, not together. She spilled the beans about missing her family, her hometown, and wanted to pursue her master's degree. I knew she still had feelings for me, but moving away to be on her own for a while was something she needed to do. We were both still quite young. For a loner like me, it was a revelation that more extroverted people have a need to be alone too, or in her case, a need for complete independence. We separated, she moved, we wrote letters to each other for a while, after not receiving replies to a good portion of ink-stained paper, I also stopped writing her. The only important thing left for me to do was to wish her happiness. As I was not able to replicate the intensity of what I had felt for her in the following years, those memories are still dear to me to this very day. This year would have marked our 25th anniversary. If it was not for that... I probably would not have bored you with these sentimental thoughts. I did, every now and then over the last 20 years. But no need for a dire mood, she sent me a letter last week. I did not expect to receive correspondence from her. It was written on fancy stationery with an embossed tree, no less. As it turns out, she never really forgot me or her feelings for me. We will, in fact, make arrangements for a face-to-face -face meeting at some point in the near future. I do not believe in luck, but do a fellow lumberjack a favor and wish him some for a favorable outcome of said meeting, would you? In the mood to talk again, are you? More specific, please. Do you frequently engage in such prying inquiries? Anyway... Listen, let me tell you a little something about dead wood. And I need you to listen to me carefully. That dry, rotten stuff is the main ingredient for a really dangerous situation right in the forest. And I'm not talking about your neighbor David tripping over it and falling face first into a pile of wet leaves. I've seen that more than once, phone in hand, while trying to take ridiculous amounts of pictures of squirrels. He ate more leaves than a donkey. Deadwood is more of an actual problem in summer, one that a good forester needs to take care of immediately. In summer, foresters are on permanent fire watch. A lot of forests are monitored with all kinds of sensors nowadays. Ours is not, so you need to be vigilant at all times. Even the tiniest shard of glass from a broken bottle can spark a fire if the sun shines from an unfortunate angle. More than once, I reminded David to pick up what was left of his phone screen after it got smashed on a rock while he was chewing on leaves. Tell me, 
Are you fully aware of your surroundings when walking through the forest? You better be, otherwise you will be in a lot of trouble. And do me a favor, would you? If you happen to be roaming the woods and see irresponsible activity that could lead to burning results, either let the people know in a diplomatic fashion that they need to be careful or contact your local forester. I am in charge of clearing the forest from dead wood and other hazards, but I do not have my eyes on every leaf at all times. Any forester, community, and even the resident wildlife will be thankful for avoiding any dangerous situation in the woods. Because offenses in the forest can become quite expensive for the offenders, even if nothing happened, it is in their interest too. Just because you think it is romantic to make a campfire in the woods does not mean you are allowed to. Enjoy your walk in the woods. I do have my eyes on you, except when David is stumbling around. Then my eyes are on him. I would appreciate it if you could clarify the subject you would like to discuss. A commendable choice. You do know that these tiny wheels on modern suitcases are a rather new invention, correct? A couple of decades ago, people were properly carrying their suitcases by the handle. If you happen to watch any old movie where people are walking to the train, you only hear their footsteps. I have a strong dislike for the rattling and grinding noise the wheels of the trolley suitcases make on the ground. A good suitcase, if you ask me, is a quiet suitcase. I am carving a suitcase from wood. I am using walnut for the elegant appearance. From the handle to the hinges that hold together the compartments, all wood. It's silent, it's sturdy, and you can rest assured that it doesn't get thrown around with the other luggage at the airport. Carelessly throwing around an 80-pound suitcase is not that easy, and that's just the weight of the empty suitcase. As you can see, it solves multiple problems at once. In addition, it's classy, exponentially classier than those manufactured with plastic. You are welcome, travelers. <laughs>